Hello everyone. Uh, again, as you can see, I have a slide deck. Uh, this is starting to be a trend, I think, and it works for some topics like this. So um, I guess I'm not going to knock it. You know, it just means that I spent more than four seconds preparing. Uh, this is actually take two. Uh, take one weighed in at just under an hour, but kind of got a bit rambly and off topic. So I thought I'd redo it and maybe stay a little closer on topic. But that does illustrate that this is a fairly uh, big topic. It's, so it's going to be fairly long. There's 20 odd slides here, so it's obviously going to take just a little while to go through. Now, uh, lately I've been seeing a lot of really egregious errors in dialogue formatting and, and writing in amateur fiction. And, I, you know, I, I get, it's getting worse. Or maybe I'm getting more sensitive to it. Uh, one, one way or the other, uh, it's very prevalent and I've been seeing a few fairly common errors. And it seems like they all could be solved if people actually knew how dialogue is supposed to be presented in English. Now, I should mention that I'm coming at this from a North American perspective. So for the most part, I'm going to talk about the way things are as the style goes in North American publications. I should also mention that I'm talking about narrative style here. I'm not talking about academic style for quoting sources. There's a lot of similarities, but uh, narrative style has a few additional conventions that make the narrative flow easier and cater to particular needs of the narrative rather than just for the mechanical needs of uh, quoting source material. And now, I'm not specifically talking about uh, general punctuation or things like that. I'll only get into that as it applies to presenting dialogue. So uh, before we can understand why the dialogue style is the way it is in narrative writing, uh, we need some requirements. Uh, and those are pretty straightforward. Uh, first, you have to be able to clearly separate the quote, the dialogue, from the surrounding prose. That's non-negotiable. If you don't know what the quote is, then what's the point of having it? We also need to be able to clearly identify who the speaker is. Uh, basically, the quotes have to be attributed. And we're, because this is narrative, we can't use footnotes and things like that to attribute it correctly. That's one of the differences between narrative writing and academic writing. Dope. Um, and there also has to be a way to identify different types of dialogue if that is relevant in the context. Uh, that could be anything from internal or external um, uh, speech, uh, 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 say an internal monologue compared to uh, speaking out loud, or different uh, methods of speaking uh, say in a science fiction setting where you have aliens that have a an incompatible vocal tract and that happens to be important for identifying how uh, communication is going on. Uh, in a lot of cases this isn't going to be relevant but the internal external distinction shows up a lot more often than you might think in narrative writing. Okay now on to the slide that you got a brief preview of before. Uh, the, the standard style in English, and again, this is from a North American perspective, but the standard style is fairly straightforward. It's at the top level, uh, you know, the, the 
quote that's right in the, the text, you surround it in the regular quotation mark, often called double quotes, to distinguish it from single quotes. Um, other uh, areas do use single quotes for the topmost quotation in some circumstances, and that's certainly something that you can uh, uh, you, you can uh, look up uh, and see what the accepted style in your area is or where you're submitting the work to. But I see uh, largely on uh, the internet the North American style seems to predominate. Now, nested quotations or dialogue, that's a quote that's inside of another quote just uses the opposite form, single or double, compared to the quote it's enclosed in. Um, and that rule applies however many levels down you are. So you start out with double quotes. The thing, next thing quoted uses single quotes. The next thing inside of that uses double quotes, and then single, then double. It just keeps going in the uh, alternating fashion. Uh, Although you probably want to avoid nesting more than well, you know, one, maybe two things down, just for clarity. Uh, scare quotes sh uh, should be treated as ordinary quotes. Uh, and that means they switch single or double based on what they're enclosed in. Now, this is actually one of the uh, reasons you might want to use single quotes for your top level quotations especially if you have a rule where scare quotes use double quotes normally. Then scare quotes look the same no matter whether they're in dialogue or not, as long as you're only, you're not nesting uh, multiple quotations inside each other. But in the absence of that sort of uh, rule, uh, scare quotes will be double quotes in the main prose or in a quotation uh, dialogue There'll be single quotes. Uh, it's, it's just that simple. Uh, one thing that tends to confuse people is what do you do when you have a, a quote or a statement, a speech, I guess, that spans multiple paragraphs, which you will hap, have if you've got some long stretch of dialogue, and that shows up. Uh, fairly regularly, actually. Uh, basically, uh, un you don't put the closing quotation mark until the actual end of the quote, uh, as you would expect. The closing quotation mark only appears at the end of the speech, however many paragraphs down that happens to be. But... At the start of every subsequent paragraph in the quote, the opening quotation marks appear. This is just a reminder to the reader that they're reading a speech. Uh, that, and if it's a nested uh, quote that's spanning the paragraphs, then you'll have however many uh, quotation marks stacked up at the start of the paragraph to get to the nesting level. So if you have a quote inside a quote uh, that's, you know, at the start of the paragraph, you will have a double quote followed by a single quote followed by the continuation of the, uh, of the dialogue. Uh, and this is there just as a reminder for the reader. Uh, some manuscript styles will ask you not to do that. Uh, so you should actually check the style uh, requirements for uh, where you're sending your manuscript if you're doing so. But if, you're, if what you're submitting is the final typeset form, which it is if you're submitting it to a website, for instance, then you should be using this. Another important standard, but this one's a little bit more flexible, is that whenever a different speaker starts talking, whenever you switch speakers, you should have a new paragraph. Uh, if you can make it clear who's talking without doing that, maybe you don't. 
but for the most part the standard thing is to have each person each new person speaking have a new paragraph and that becomes uh, also useful a useful cue that you might have a new speaker uh, that's something that becomes particularly important when you're using uh, implied attribution, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, you may consider using uh, block quotes, which is basically indented quotation, usually using a denser uh, font or uh, spacing uh, technique. Uh, so in double space text, it tends to be single spaced. Uh, or possibly a smaller font or, or what have you. For very long quotations, you might use this. Uh, and this will also often be used for verse because the formatting of uh, poetry and song uh, is often uh, important to have the lines split up correctly. Um, it's also useful when the quoted text itself contains complex quotations. So you don't have to deal with uh, nesting of quotation marks as much. So it's definitely beneficial. Uh, now you might also consider other stylistic uh, options uh, for long quotations uh, to help with clarity. Uh, that may include, uh, say, varying the font face or format, like having uh, a, law, a passage in uh, all in italics uh, to indicate that it's, uh, say, uh, a story being told. Or maybe you use a scene break and, you know, have a few sentences to introduce that the story is being told, scene break, and then you just tell the story normally until the end, scene break, and then you get back to the original action with the storyteller being finished. Uh, there's a number of ways you can do this. Uh, you know, you could use a different font. You could, you could do any number of things. But the key is what you're doing should be fairly clear. Uh, it's actually quite common to use the scene break mechanism for a particularly extended uh, storytelling. Uh, and it's not uncommon to have the italics or font face method uh, for a fairly short telling that might run a few pages at most. Uh, something that tends to confuse people a lot also is trailing punctuation in quoted text uh, and also uh, conversely punctuation at the start, capitalization, that sort of thing. Uh, this is something I'm not going to get into huge detail on here, uh, partly because what is acceptable does depend largely on where you're uh, submitting your work. The key here is that you need to be consistent within your work. Uh, don't uh, do random different things at different times. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if the quotation ends a sentence, so you're not having an attribution tag or something like that after the quotation, then whatever punctuation mark would end the quotation goes there inside the closing quote. That part's not controversial. If the quotation doesn't end with a punctuation mark, which would be unusual for narrative dialogue, then the sentence ending punctuation will often move inside the closing quote, especially if it is a period. Uh, but that is not likely to come up in narrative writing. Uh, and if it does, you can probably get away with moving the, uh, leaving the sentence ending punctuation outside of the quotation mark. The key here is if the quotation already has an ending punctuation other than a period, you don't add a period after the quotation mark. That's the key there. Um, introducing a quotation mark, a quotation or dialogue, uh, you will generally have a comma before the actual uh, dialogue starts inside the quotation marks. Um, sometimes the introductory bit of text will simply be a, a full sentence on its own, in which case you'll have a full sentence and then the dialogue starts normally. 
uh, you will usually capitalize the leading uh, uh, word in the dialogue, uh, whether it's in the middle of the sentence, you know, introduced by a comma or not. But there are a few cases where you might not. And there are a few cases where you might not use the comma at all. Also, if you have the attributive tag at the end of the uh, dialogue, if the dialogue ends in a period normally, that will usually switch to a comma and will be inside the quotation marks. Uh, so, uh, but most other punctuation marks will remain as they are normally, and you'll be on your way and you won't add an additional one. That's the basic rules of thumb. Uh, you, if you want to do something different, be prepared to justify it to your editor if you have one, uh, because it may be that what you want to do is right for that specific circumstance. So be careful with that. But the standard punctuation style is generally fine for dialogue. It's usually in academic works where uh, in some cases you absolutely have to keep the uh, actual punctuation of the quotation correct, uh, but that's not likely to be the case in actual uh, narrative style. Okay, attribution, that's an important part of the actual writing style. Uh, beyond just the punctuation and uh, and how that works. And here you'll see some examples that include a uh, typical punctuation of uh, uh, of uh, dialogue in uh, in English. Uh, attribution is usually done in, by involving speech verbs like say, um, which since uh, narrative writing is usually done in the past tense, uh, you'll have, past tense forms like said. But uh, n narrative writing can be done in any verb tense that you want. It can be present or future tense as well. So uh, it, the appropriate form of the verb uh, would, would be there. So uh, in a present tense telling, then you would say, you say or says. And in uh, future tense, you, say, you would say will say. Uh, so uh, it uh, it can be done in any tense, but the standard uh, English storytelling uses past tense. So here we go. Here's an example. John said, hello, Fred. That has the uh, attribution at the beginning. Hello, John, Fred said. That has the attribution at the end. And what are you doing today? John said. And again, the attribution's at the end, but note that we have a question mark uh, is the end of the dialogue there, so there's no extra extra punctuation mark there. So that, that shows you the basic idea of uh, punctuating dialogue, and if you use this basic guideline, it will tend to serve you well. But the attribution is the point here, and you can see that the said bits there uh, don't, uh, they're not particularly intrusive uh, when you're reading because uh, said is one of the very few words uh, in English that pretty much is invisible uh, when you're reading. Uh, and that's, it's a function word when you're dealing with dialogue. So uh, kind of like the and that sort of thing, they pretty much disappear. But as you can see, if you have pages of dialogue going on, this gets redundant very quickly. And it tends to, it gets boring to write, and eventually the reader's going to notice it, especially if you have back and forth dialogue. So it gets, it gets redundant quickly. And that brings us to implied attribution. Um, attribution can be skipped when it's obvious from context, as it is when only two speakers are involved. Uh, now, there are other cases where it can be obvious, like if the um, subject of a paragraph uh, is, uh, you know, doing things, then you might be able to get away without having an attributive uh, tag on dialogue if he starts talking. Uh, that's uh, 
something that you have to consider on a case-by-case -case basis. But typically, where you get the implied attribution uh, most of the time comes from uh, conversational dialogue uh, to avoid having the he said, she said, he said, she said type business. So here's the same dialogue from the previous slide. John said, hello, Fred. Hello, John. What are you doing today? Okay, so you've got three there. Now, it doesn't work as well when spoken aloud. That's a key point here. This only works well in writing. So if you're reading this to somebody else, you might need to synthesize the, the uh, attribution tags to make it clear. But for reading the written word, uh, then uh, it's perfectly clear. The first line has the attribution and it's pretty much necessary to identify who the first speaker is. Now you could potentially avoid that uh, with context, especially when you've got names involved and things like that. Uh, if only two people have been talked about in the text leading up to this and somebody says, hello, Fred, and, and it's only John and Fred who've been talked about, then you, you probably assume that John said it. But making it explicit is certainly not a bad thing. The second line is clearly not John talking. What he said has ended. You had the closing quote. So now you've got another bit of dialogue. And this is Fred saying it. And then his dialogue ends with a closing quote. The, the next, uh, next line is... John asking a question. Now here's an important point here. Um, when I was talking about multi-paragraph dialogue, if the closing quotation mark after hello John was missing, that would mean that Fred would be asking the question. But with that closing quotation mark there, it means John is asking the question. This is why the closing quotation mark is critical to be in the right place. That's also why you don't close the quotation marks at the end of every paragraph, even if the quotation continues. That does mean that in the standard style, multi-paragraph quotations have unbalanced quotation marks. That is fine. That's the style. But basically, <clears throat> basically, how implied attribution works is that after each quotation closes, the next one is assumed to be the other speaker. Now, implied attribution should be avoided with long quotations. And here's a nice uh, typo. I misspelled especially here. Um, and I forgot to fix it before doing take two here. But anyway, I do know it's spelled with an S, not an X. Don't write me about that, okay? Um, anyway, uh, with long quotations, it's easy to forget who the other characters are in the conversation. So uh, it's a good idea to have the next statement probably have an explicit attribution attached to it. Especially if it's three or four or five fairly long paragraphs. Uh, that's going to be important. Um, with And with long pages of back and forth uh, conversation, you'll probably want to throw in the odd attribution along the way so that, that people can uh, resync if they somehow lose track. Uh, implied attribution also gets very confusing when you have more than two uh, characters involved in the conversation. Uh, in that case, the only time you can really get away with it is when two of the group are having a back and forth. And again, you should keep that to a minimum in a uh, multi-party uh, conversation. The only time you can get away with it is when there is a fixed order for the speakers and you have to make that clear in the text. Uh, but even then, it's probably not ideal to use it in this case. About the only time it can work uh, 
uh, when you've got a large group is when it's faceless um, uh, teeming masses in a crowd or something and you've got uh, statements that really can't be attributed to anyone in particular by the listener. Uh, basically the key here is that two subsequent or adjacent quotes must not be by the same speaker unless there's descriptive text that says so as well. Uh, if, you, uh, if you do that then implied attribution will confuse the reader because adjacent quotes are assumed to be by different speakers. That's what implied attribution means. Uh, so that's, that's a big reason why uh, you need to make sure that if you have two adjacent quotes by the same speaker, you have some descriptive text in between them uh, so, and make it clear who's saying both. Uh, I mentioned at the start uh, uh, dialogue modes. Uh, that's things like internal monologues or uh, uh, telepathic conversations or alien speech with incompatible uh, uh, vocal tracks and things like that. This can be represented with the standard style with appropriate descriptive text in the attribution tags uh, and other contexts. That does uh, get redundant, though, because you have to continually do it. You have to explicitly uh, indicate it. Uh, so uh, in the case of internal uh, explicit thoughts, uh, you're going to have to say things like, he thought all the time. Uh, but uh, it can be avoided uh, by using other mechanisms. For internal monologues with explicit thoughts, like mental speech, um, either to oneself or telepathically, italics is often used. And it's used in the same mechanism as uh, quotation marks, except there's no actual marks. Um, and uh, incidentally, italicized text inside uh, italicized text shows as non-italicized. Uh, basically, it's a binary switch. Um, it's on or off, and uh, you know, basically that's how it works. Uh, but uh, it, the you can have the he thought or whatever tags attached to it. Uh, more often than not, though, if it's an explicit thought, uh, it will just show italicized, undecorated, in a paragraph where the character thinking it is the subject of the, uh, of, of the action, uh, and, and in particular is the point of view character if a uh, limited third person uh, structure is used, or a first person structure is used. Uh, a key here is uh, this wouldn't be the case if you're just describing the point of view character's thoughts on what they're seeing. Uh, if you're uh, presenting an explicit monologue in their mind, that would get the italics. But uh, typically, we don't italicize general internal observations and monologues and things. Uh, unless it's an explicit uh, important uh, thing that they might say aloud. Uh, and that's just to avoid, I think, generally having pages and pages of italics. Uh, you know, uh, that's a key. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, internal monologues won't actually be italicized at all, uh, just because uh, of just that. And it's often important, an important part of the uh, the uh, uh, description of what's going on. Uh, and it'll be fairly clear uh, from the narrative uh, whether you're seeing uh, internal uh, uh, monologue just presented as prose or not. And it's a very common technique used in the first person and uh, limited third person uh, 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 styles, I guess. Uh, you, you may also see uh, other quote-like marks uh, used uh, for non-typical speech modes and sometimes even for telepathy uh, just to uh, give a clear immediate mark uh, that it's not typical verbal speech being used in a mode that's compatible with humans. 
or the main characters in the story if the main characters happen not to be human. And you'll only see this when a when more than one mode of speech that's incompatible uh, is used. Uh, and that one of those may be telepathy, uh, depending on the uh, prevalence of it. So, uh, you know, you can see the one, one such set of marks is the uh, double angle bracket thing. It's, they've got a name, but I don't know what it is. Uh, you don't need to jump in the comments and tell me what it is either. I can look it up, and so can anybody else. Uh, but there are other marks that can be used. Uh, single uh, angle brackets can be used as well. Um, some, ha some authors have used things like parentheses. Uh, others have used made-up marks. Uh, whatever works uh, for your, uh, your narrative. I know in uh, one case, uh, the author, uh, it was a, a sort of sci-fi fantasy scheme, uh, the author had five or six different uh, speech styles. So, uh, and th they did use things like made up type marks and things like that uh, to delineate them. But for the most part, it wasn't horribly critical to the story. I think it was just done for amusement purposes. But it can be done, and it can be done to great effect. And these uh, these marks are definitely available on pretty much any computer. So, uh and if you, you do a little bit of investigation, you can figure out how to type them with relative ease on most systems. Okay, so uh, you may recall that uh, my point at the beginning was there's a lot of errors popping up in this stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just mention the big ones here. And, uh, you know, there's probably other errors that show up that are less uh, problematic. Uh, the big, big one is missing opening or closing quotation marks, or conversely, extra opening or closing quotation marks. I see this all the time, uh, where the closing quotation mark before an attribution tag is missing, or the opening quotation mark after an attribution tag is missing. Um, often this will happen when the attribution tag splits a quote. Uh, where uh, it shows up between clauses in the uh, dialogue or between sentences in the dialogue. And that is problematic because it confuses the reader. I've also seen cases where extra quotation marks show up, and that certainly is confusing as well, although it's less problematic uh, when there's an extra opening quote, especially when proper curved quotation marks uh, are used. Uh, the reason for that is an extra opening quotation mark is pretty obviously bogus if uh, the uh, uh, nesting rules are followed properly. Extra closing quotation marks, however, are problematic. Another thing I see quite often in uh, amateur writing, and very occasionally it gets through in professionally uh, edited uh, writing as well, is losing track of who is speaking during a, a chain of implied attribution quotes. Now, this is not the reader losing track. This is the writer losing track. Uh, so as an example, you have... Uh, uh, person A says the first line, uh, the first uh, uh, speech, and then it's B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, and so on. And then uh, the last one, say, is said by B, but the attribution tag says A said it. Well, now you've got a problem because the you, you could be pretty sure that the author, it means that the one they said, said that last uh, last speech, did say it. And you know that the first one was said, you know, that tag had to be correct as well. Which means there's either an extra line somewhere in the middle or a missing line. Now, this can show up if you've got an extra closing quote at the end of a paragraph for a multi-paragraph one. Or it can show up when you just miss something. And uh, oftentimes, it's the 
there's a closing quote at the end of a paragraph that shouldn't be there. But sometimes there is something missing, or the author has actually put two statements by the same uh, speaker side by side in, you know, in separate paragraphs. And that could happen if there had been a descriptive text in between that got removed and things like that. So when you're editing, you need to make sure that you check your chains of implied attribution. Uh, so here's what I was saying. Um, placing two quotes by the same character immediately adjacent without descriptive text leads you to that kind of uh, uh, desynchronization in the implied dialogue chain. And adding that extra closing quotation mark does the same uh, when it shouldn't be there. Uh, so don't do either one of those. Uh, another common error that I've seen, is, but it's not as common as the others, is inconsistent use of mode markers, you know, italics or other quote-like marks. Uh, it's usually italics that goes wrong, and uh, oftentimes uh, you'll have a work starts out, it doesn't use it at all for internal monologues, and then it starts using it. Or it starts out using it and then forgets it in a few spots. And it can be subtle, the distinction, uh, about when to use it and when not to. But the key is you have to be consistent. This doesn't show up near as often. Uh, but I think a lot of times when it does, it's actually just a typesetting error uh, rather than uh, an, an error on the part of the uh, author when they're actually writing. Uh, sometimes it's a case where the italics just runs on, means somebody forgot to turn it off, or things like that. Yeah, so uh, there really isn't much to say in closing, but uh, what I I will uh, say is that uh, as a a writer, you owe it to your readers to be careful with the style of the language you're writing in. If English is a second language for you, you need to make sure you understand the dialogue writing styles used in English. You can't take what the style is in your native language and just apply it to English. Uh, it isn't likely going to work, especially if your language uses different mechanisms for introducing dialogue, that, literal dialogue. Uh, and that is the case in a number of languages. Some writing systems don't have quotation marks. Uh, and it's interesting that I, I've, I've seen uh, cases where um, languages that didn't historically use quotation marks have actually adopted the English style quotation marks or have invented symbols to serve the same purpose. Uh, so it's clear that it's useful in narrative writing. Uh, you know, like even uh, even the uh, the kanji used in Japan has uh, quotation marks, uh, and they're used basically the same as they are in English. It's uh, uh, so it, it it actually makes some sense. Uh, that said, you can't necessarily take the English style and apply it to another language either. Uh, although it will generally work when applied to um, uh, most, uh, say, European languages, uh, although that's still not the style generally used in a lot of of the uh, uh, writing systems out there. So you need to check on it. Some prefer to use the, that double angle bracket thing for uh, quotation marks, and, and that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, it's uh, I've seen a lot of French text, for instance, that uses those. So uh, it's perfectly reasonable uh, to do that. Uh, but it's it's generally uh, disrespectful to your readers if you don't put the effort into learning the standard styles for writing uh, in the language you're writing in. 
and that applies even if you're unilingual and you're writing in your native or you're writing in your native tongue. Uh, make sure you know what the formats are, the styles are, the standards are, what your readers are expecting. Because if you deviate from that without a good reason, you're going to confuse your readers at best and piss them off at worst. I've seen uh, some amateur texts where uh, it is complete. The errors are completely consistent across the entire text. That means the author doesn't know what they're doing, and they they do kind of deserve the ridicule they potentially get for it. Uh, one of the errors that I, I mentioned, uh, the, the missing opening quote after uh, an internal attributive tag, you know, that, that splits a quote. Uh, I was reading one amateur work where every single instance of that did the same thing. That means the author is systematically doing it. Now, that could be unintentional, but, uh, you know, once or twice, yeah, you know, I can forgive it as an error or a typo or something like that. But when they do it every single time, that becomes a pattern. And when it shows up in every one of their works, that is an even bigger pattern. Now, I'm not going to call out anyone specifically here because that would be rude. And the people watching these videos probably have no idea who these people would be anyway. So I'm not going to do that. But it's this, that's the sort of thing you want to avoid, the systematic wrong thing. Uh, I've seen it uh, in other contexts as well. Uh, wrong word choices and things like that in many cases or consistent spelling errors for particular words so uh you know, i'm not going to get into that because this video is long enough as it is but uh, the that's the big thing uh have respect for your readers and get your style straight get it right your readers will have a much better time of it uh and you know, I, I'm going to leave off with uh, one final point. I have seen stuff that looked interesting, looked like it would be interesting, but it was completely unreadable once you combined the all of the systematic errors that the uh, that the author and I use the term loosely made. That included incorrect uh, dialogue uh, style. Uh, they didn't, which was probably an outgrowth of the fact that they didn't use more than like three punctuation marks in 4,000 words. Um, but also there were massive uh, misspellings, uh, lack of punctuation, which is critical for written English. Uh, so lack of punctuation, uh, I I impossible to work out uh, quoting uh, dialogue. Um bad word choices and what I was able to understand. Uh, it was just generally horrible. Um, you know, I read one paragraph uh, and I'm not sure I understood even that paragraph and it took me 10 minutes to decipher what I did figure out. So that, in my opinion, is the height of incompetence as a writer. Uh, not bothering to learn how to write first. Uh, this writer was clearly illiterate. Clearly illiterate when it came to English. Uh, I don't know if it was English as a second language or not. And I don't care. It was completely unreadable. Uh, so the person might as well be illiterate uh, as far as uh, English writing goes. So, uh, you know, and, and I found it immensely disrespectful that this person would put that kind of horrible, well, crap out there. Uh, and, that, and that's the key uh, here, right there. Uh, take the time, learn how to do the dialogue correctly, the narrative style dialogue correctly. Uh, read some stuff, figure out how people are doing it, and then do it properly.
your readers will appreciate it. And you'll get much better feedback as a result because uh, uh, more competent uh, writers will be able to stand reading it and will be able to give you proper feedback uh, if that's what you're looking for. And more people will actually stick it out and read it if they're seeing just the occasional error as opposed to consistent errors uh, continually. Uh, anyway, I think I probably beat that to death now. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave off here. Uh, so I'm going to leave with, uh, with a couple of things here. First off, uh, if you find these types of videos interesting, feel free to suggest a uh, topic for a future one. Uh, I'll happily consider any suggestion you have. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to writing. It could be on any topic. If I find it interesting, I, I might do a video on it. Um, and of course, if you have any comments on this video, you can leave comments in the, in the doobly-doo there. Um, and uh, finally, uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. But also, make sure that you turn notifications on for, the, for my videos. There's a, a bell icon there uh, that you can click on to enable notifications. Uh, if you don't, you might not get notified. So that's, that's a, a key there. I'm not sure if that's a new thing, but I've noticed other creators are talking about it. So I'm thinking that they've made some changes in, in how things work. Either way, uh, if you want to be keep track of uh, my videos, either you're going to want to subscribe and possibly turn on notifications. And uh, finally, if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.